you, Donald, and good evening, everybody. Well, a dramatic press conference at 10 o'clock this morning. Seven Labour MPs appearing to resign from the party and form a new independent group. And don't say that it hadn't been trailed, because it had. Because on the 30th of August last year, respected veteran Labour MP Frank Field, if you remember, resigned from the Labour Party, saying uh, that it was because of the Labour leaderships becoming a force for anti-Semitism in British politics and that a culture of intolerance, nastiness and intimidation now reigns in too many parts of our party nationally and is sadly manifest within my own constituency Labour Party. And many people thought that if someone like Frank Field is walking away from the Labour Party, there's more to come. So today wasn't a complete surprise, but none of us knew how many people would be involved. It's Chaka Ramuna, Luciana Berger, Chris Leslie, Angela Smith, Mike Gapes, Gavin Shooker and Anne Coffey. And they held a press conference at 10 o'clock this morning. And some of the arguments they made echo much of what Frank Field had said back in August last year. We begin with Luciana Berger and, frankly, almost her revulsion at what the Labour Party has become. I cannot remain in a party that I have today come to the sickening conclusion is institutionally anti-Semitic. Strong stuff. It was nearly a year ago that we saw the unprecedented event of a minority community, the Jewish community, taking to Parliament Square to demonstrate against the Labour Party, to say enough is enough. And yet since then, despite a mountain of evidence, we have only seen the situation of racism against Jewish people get worse. Well, it couldn't really have been stronger, could it, from her perspective? It's about anti-Semitism. She is Jewish herself, and she's revolted by what she sees the Labour Party as having become. Chukka Ramuna, who really was the leader of this group, and, and by far uh, the most senior of this group, and I, I would say without doubt, the only one of these seven who actually is really a household name. This is what Chukka had to say about the group. You can't change the status quo if you're going to, if you like, rejoin it. So there are going to be no mergers. <laughs> There's going to be, we are not going to go and join the Liberal Democrats. Let's be absolutely clear about that. We are saying there needs to be a new offer and a new alternative. And if there are other members of Parliament, regardless of their political party in the House of Commons, who identify with and share our values, we're inviting all of them to go independent and join our independent group. But this has to genuinely be something new. So Chucker there saying you can't change from within, which is very much the view I took on the European Union, of course. And uh, they've launched their statement of intent, their statement of independence is what they've launched. Um, it lays out their values as social democrats. Um, it basically says, look, we're very nice people and we want a more prosperous country and a safe country and respect the rule of law. Uh, and the international rules-based order, we want to protect the environment, and we like motherhood and apple pie. Um, uh, fine, Chucker, but it doesn't exactly excite me. And I have to say, uh, it's pretty much a policy-free zone. Although, of course, what is interesting is that all seven of them support the people's vote. Well, here was the official response from the Shadow Chancellor, John McDonnell. So I'm disappointed, but all of these MPs stood on our manifesto in 2017, Jeremy Corbyn's manifesto, they all increased their majorities. Now they're on a different platform. So the honourable thing, the usual thing for them to do now is to stand down and fight by-elections back in their constituencies. Well, there's a thought. I mean, Chucker, if you and the rest of the gang support the people's vote, well, why not have a people's vote? Why not stand? Why not stand in by-elections saying you will go back to Parliament to fight for a people's vote, a second referendum on Brexit? But I don't think somehow that is going to happen. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. And I have to say, I'm old enough to remember back in 1981 a similar fracture from the Labour Party, but some big differences. The differences are, when the SDP was formed, it was 18 months in the making, and it was a fully-fledged political party. This is just a group of independents. They're not a political party. They haven't applied to be one. Uh, they're hoping, I think, to get, you know, people like Ken Clark, maybe, and Anis Subri from the Tories, um, and, and, and they're hoping to grow, but they're not a political party. The SDP was. I would also say this, that... Whether you agree with their politics or not, 
you know, Roy Jenkins was a senior member of that group back in 81. And Roy Jenkins had been a Chancellor of the Exchequer, a Foreign Secretary, and he'd been the President of the European Commission, the job that old Juncker has got at the moment. I mean, Jenkins was a giant. David Owen had been the youngest Foreign Secretary in 150 years and clearly very accomplished man. Shirley Williams, well, in many ways, you know, one of the sort of handful of female politicians who'd made a massive impact on British politics, and Bill Rogers IV, who'd been a Labour cabinet minister. These were four, I think it's fair to call them, big beasts. And I don't think, frankly, any of these seven are big beasts. I was also struck that the microphones didn't work terribly well. It all looked a bit amateur. The seven speeches between them were a bit long and rambling. Uh, I mean, this was the SDP. This was Roy Jenkins back in 81. It becomes the Social Democratic Party. It is the biggest break in the pattern of British politics for at least 60 years, for two generations. It was well planned. And within days, the SDP had a really massive approval rating in the country. Now, as it was, uh, they headed up to the 83 election. They tried to break the mould of British politics. They got damn close to it, but they didn't quite get there. But kind of what they did do, in a sense, was they laid the, sem the social democratic basis effectively for Blairism, which came along a few years later. I didn't see that today. So I don't think... Today's event of itself was quite as seismic as Chukka Ramuna wanted it to be. It looked a bit amateur, um, and we'll come on a bit later in the programme to Angela Smith's contribution uh, today, which we can have a sort of slight smile at. But I, I believe very strongly that what you saw today is a symptom that two-party politics is fragmenting. That's what I believe in, and fun enough... Vince Cable uh, was on with Eddie Mayer just a few minutes ago, and this was Vince. British politics is changing. The, the, the two big parties we're used to are now beginning to fracture. I don't agree with what Nigel Farage said, actually, a few months ago. About I'll just that. say that again. <laughs> uh, I agree with what Nigel Farage said a few months ago. The, well, the, the political system is fracturing. There you are, so the leader of the Liberal Democrats, twice in a few seconds, said he agrees with me. So, folks, I put, I'm putting it to you that what happened today is a symptom that two-party politics is fragmenting. And if you agree with me and think the splits will grow in both parties, and there's going to be an, an emergence of new political forces, call 0345 973 or maybe you think, actually, the two-party system will hold together because of first-past-the-post, text to 84850. And tell me, do you feel politically homeless? Are you looking for something new in British politics? Please tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC, at LBC, and, of course... Watch us on Facebook and comment there, too. Andrew is a caller from Colchester. Good evening, Andrew. Good evening, Nigel. So, was today a symptom of fragmentation, or is it my imagination? Yeah. No, I completely agree with everything you're saying. Um, I think it's, there is fragmentation because the British public are crying out to be better represented. Um, I, mean, I go back, you can probably like what I, what I start off by saying, is if, if UKIP had got... 10% of the MPs in 2015, mm. as they should have done, because 10% of the population... Well, near a 13%, near, near a 13 percent, Andrew, but anyway, but Sorry, that, that, that's, pardon, that's by the by. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, if they'd have got that, you'd have had much more pressure that you'd have been able to put on to David Cameron during that, during that time that would have been not more pressurised in, in parliamentary level, um, whereby... You, you never quite know how you'd have actually been able to work things with within the UK government and with the EU. Instead, we've gone down this referendum that's caused this massive division in the country um, and a lot of fighting. Now, I think if people had actually felt more represented, you wouldn't have had all this particular bitterness. That may be true. No, that may be true. I mean, I, I, I do think, Andrew, that the first-past-the-post system is out of date. I mean, I sense, actually, even in Parliament, half the Labour MPs and half the Tory MPs don't really, don't really like their own party, but they stick with it as a means of getting re-elected. So, big, big change to come, Andrew, in your view. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think the people need to feel more represented. Mm, There's agree. not enough choice on the ballot paper. I'm, 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 I'm a homeless as regards voting. I, mm. And mm. I, I turn up on, on every general election. I don't, I don't want to vote for my MP. 
he'll win by a mile in the constituency <laughs> I live in. And, and yet, uh, is that a healthy democracy? No, nope. Andrew. To feel that there's no point in turning up and you're voting. Andrew, place? it's not working anymore. It's broken down. Thank you. Moving on to Sean from Horsham. Good evening, Sean. Oh, hi. Hi, Nigel. Um, the way I see this is it's an attempt by uh, Blairism to mm -hmm. effectively uh, win back the, uh, the centre uh, to, to try and bring back um, what I see as a what he called the third way, mm -hmm. but in but in effect, he brought in a lot of corporate power into the off the back of government funding. So, so we had PFI and we had I we know. had um, we had academy schools and the, and the abuses that have been adopted now by the by the Tories in relation to that. Now, the way I see this is, you've had people tonight on Lady Mayor Show. We had Blunkett, an one of the architects, along with Mandelson, Straw, Hattersley, Campbell. As the sort of neoliberal cartel of has beens, and and then and you've, you've let them come on and effectively smear the, the guy on Eddie Mayer's show before was from Momentum. He was actually a mild mannered mild mannered liberal, okay. And yet here we are being called, you know, defence of Russia, which is rubbish. We don't defend Russia, um, and a revolutionary sect, and that Corbyn's a security risk. It seems like LBC always want to Sean, bring on a Nick. Sean, a Nick Sean, yes. Sean, okay, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Let's peel that away. Let's peel that away, um, and let's not use any of those adjectives. But should we say this, and I know you're a Labour Party member, should we just say this? There is a massive split in the Labour Party between Social Democrat Blairites and Socialists. Yes, that, that's, that's fine. But, I mean, Angela Smith, for example, and, and water privatisation and fracking... And the fact that their new their new website was registered in, the, in Panama for this new company, the Independent Group. You know, the, the, the well, back, I, I, the let's not get into that, Sean. Sean, what Labour Party do you want? Do you want Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party? Do you believe that's the right place for you to be? Um, absolutely. I, I want again, but going back to Blunkett's words before, the he was effectively putting down the whole of the, the, the Corbyn project as, as rubbish it, by saying that he agrees with some of it. I think he, there's nothing there in, that, in those policies that, that people shouldn't be following. They're, they're, there's, they're all good policies. Well, I mean, it's, well, it's mother I mean, and apple pie is what they were talking about. But, Sean, do you, let, let me just ask you one last quick thing. Do you accept that with the kind of ideas on taxation and many other things that are supported by McDonnell and Corbyn that you simply cannot win a general election? Um, I, I don't, you know, I've, I've been studying modern monetary theory and understand the, that new money doesn't actually come from... Um, that wasn't my question, good, Sean. Yeah, there's a lot of good economists like, say, Mariana um, Makazuto, who talk Sean, about... Sean, I'm talking often. about, I'm talking about people out there who are busy earning a living, bringing up their kids, paying their mortgages, you don't mortgages, study you don't economic study. theory, don't read political, don't, don't, don't read heavy political books, they just decide who's the right person to vote for at the next general election. And I think McDonnell and Corbyn, with some of their hard left policies and momentum support, actually put off as many as they attract. Hard left. They're not hard it's left. Not hard. All right. Absolutely not. All right, all right, Sean, you've, you've, mounted, a, you've mounted a sturdy defence. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show here on LBC at 6.16 and time for the news headlines with Philip Chrysokar. As seven Labour MPs resign the Labour Party and form an independent group, I'm asking, is this the problem just of the Labour Party? Because clearly they're in trouble and vicious infighting and words being said against each other today. Or is it a broader problem? Is it a symptom? actually of a fragmentation of what's happening in politics. Could this indeed happen to the Conservative Party? Is it in many ways that British politics just can't cope with Brexit? And, and yep, sure, they talked today, the seven that left, about, just as Frank Field had done in August last year, they talked about the growth of anti-Semitism within the party, they talked about the hard left takeover, uh, but also behind it all, as all seven of them have been supporting a people's vote, but not for themselves. These seven rebel MPs want to have their cake and eat it. They refuse to fight by-elections. Well, I, I know, James, that's absolutely right. No by-election, double standards. Come on, be honest with us, says Mandy in Islington. Well, uh, Andy says, can none of the above be put on the general election paper? Do you know, Andy, in the French, second round of the French presidential election, and that was a runoff between Macron and Marine Le Pen, a stunning five million French voters wrote 
no confidence in any. Actually, I think what they wrote was quite a lot ruder than that. But five million of them turned up to spoil papers. So you can, if you want, Andy, spoil a paper. But I... I just wonder, given the w- given the way politics is and how many how so many people feel homeless, I wonder whether by the time the next election comes there'll be some more choices. I'll make another prediction. We had a ridiculous referendum on changing the voting system half a dozen years ago. It was for an AV system. It, it, it was actually preferential, not proportional. Goodness knows how Clegg ever agreed to that. But I will make a prediction. You will see a lot more people now campaigning for electoral reform in this country. You know, previous caller we had said, doesn't matter how I vote, it's a safe Tory seat. And I think something like AV+, Plus, where you have two ballot papers, at least you would feel living in a safe Labour or safe Tory seat, there was a second vote you could use that would actually help towards getting someone represented. And then what we'd have is a parliament where any view that wasn't just a complete fringe minority would have representation in parliament. It would be a lot healthier for our politics. Old people tell me, but Nigel, it would mean coalition government. Wouldn't that be awful? But you know what? Germany's had coalitions ever since 1945, and they've done, I think, really rather well. So... Is British politics fragmenting? And is, indeed, is Labour now the nasty party? I'm going to go to Nathaniel in Dover. Good evening, Nathaniel. Good evening, Nigel. Um, yeah, this is a bit bit of a, um, you know, it's one of them where it's it's confirmed my feelings um, towards the Labour Party. A bit of a background for you, Nigel. I'm actually a councillor down here um, in Dover District Council. Well, I was. I'm on long-term sick. I got very, very unwell in July well, with luck. my mental health. Um, That's awful. But I was a Labour councillor up until a fortnight ago until I rescinded my membership. Oh. Um, because A, f- a for fortnight the- ago? Yes, literally two weeks ago, I wrote to the regional party um, saying, you know, you didn't support me when I needed your help, when I had problems with my mental health. Um, I've witnessed firsthand bullying um, of the only member of the Labour group who actually helped me. He was bullied and forced out of the uh, the Labour group down here in Dover um, on some many disgusting points, actually, the way they treated it. Um, also, I've reported anti-Semitic... Um, uh, you know, views and comments from Labour members, which weren't dealt with. I actually got a, uh, an email from Labour Party HQ not considering a Labour member with a YouTube channel, Sieg Heilin, as anti-Semitic. Um, mm. I, I mean, which... Nathaniel, Nathaniel, tell me, you know, in your opinion, are momentum a nasty lot? Um, if you don't agree with them, they make things very difficult. Whilst I actually share some political views, I do not, and I absolutely detest the way they carry themselves forward because my attitude's been, you know what, I may not agree with you, but I'll listen to your point of view because I may learn something. Do you blame Nathaniel? Do you blame the Gang of Seven, then, for for resigning the whip today, or do you completely understand why they've done it? I think they could have done it better. Um, (laughs) Instead of making it into a big whole PR exercise which has got people on their backs um, I think they could have carried it better. Uh, it's been a long time coming but personally Nigel I think the whole British political system is now unsustainable Yes, I and agree. I actually think it's a good thing yep. because yep. it's not binary it isn't a binary thing no. every election I voted I voted for the person not the party. Would you support, um, Nathaniel, would you, as somebody actively involved in politics, would you support some degree of electoral reform now? I've Since I've come out of doing A-levels in college many years ago, I've always been for proportional rent- representation. Okay. The Italian system works really well. Do you know what? If we had it, the parties would bust apart tomorrow. Nathaniel, thank you very much for that personal testimony. I'm sorry about the problems that you've had. And lots of you feeling really quite angry at the lack of of by-election. It's a bit rich of Labour saying that the seven deserters should resign and stand in by-elections because they're not representing their constituents who voted Labour. What about the other Labour MPs who are not representing their constituents who voted to leave the EU? Robert in Wolverhampton, you have made a very good, strong point. Mind you, in a couple of weeks' time, there could be a lot of Conservatives saying much the same thing if Brexit's not delivered. Let's go to Anton, a first-time caller from Clapham. Good evening, Anton. Hi, Nigel. Pleasure to speak to you. So, is British politics on the verge of fragmenting? Um, well, just before that, the point I want to make yeah, is, 
Um, I, you like the irony of the, uh, the them contending their by-elections and, and the people's vote of that. I think there's a bigger irony at play here. Mm. These Labour MPs have decided that they need to leave their organisation as they simply couldn't change it from within. Couldn't reform now, where have we seen that <laughs> Well, he's exactly my argument about the European Union, Anton. So, Isn't that the yeah, whole thing? Yeah, that irony did not pass me by, I've got to tell you. Um, so the state of British politics, Anton, are these parties going to hold together? Is the electoral system, if it's not changed, going to hold them together? Or are we in for, uh, you know, almost a realignment of British politics? Um, I think that the way it's set up now with pro- pro- proportional representation, that will afford the two major parties are buffer, and um, they will eventually, I think, realign with um, the popular views in this country. Um, so I think before there can be huge electoral reform, we're more likely to see the parties actually realign with the way the British, the British um, public sentiment. Uh, and how would that manifest itself then? Well, I think that you will um, probably see a Labour's party of some sort moving more towards um, the Remain stance, if, if we're looking short term, and the Conservative Party being as they are now, uh, perhaps more towards um, the view, uh, the leaning towards more uh, ERJ or ERG way. Yep. Sorry, um, but, in terms of uh, well, that may be true, really. Anton. But if if I mean, you know, I think this: if the Labour Party lose that social democratic wing. They haven't got a catch chance in hell of winning any elections at all. I mean, you've got to say, Neil Kinnock may himself in the end have not, not proved to be electable, but he made the Labour Party electable by getting rid of the hard left, all those scenes we saw at Labour Party conferences. You know, is there not some truth, Anton, to the, the idea that the hard left have now hijacked the Labour Party? Well, uh, it would appear that way, but is, uh, is it sustainable that they will stay in control of the Labour Party? I don't believe so. I think that today marks uh, maybe an exit for Corbyn. Mm, could be. Anton, fascinating. Uh, well, I have to say, folks, I, I I thought that today's launch was amateur in the extreme. And one of them, Angela Smith MP, she was the lady who last week tried to hand in the People's Vote petition to Labour HQ and got turned away at the door. Uh, But her performance today was amateur in the extreme, and we'll look at that in a moment. But for now, you're listening to The Nigel Farage Show here on LBC, and it's 6.30 in time for the news with Philip Chrysikos. <laughs> Labour's in trouble as seven Social Democrats, because that's what they are, break away today from the Labour Party and form their own independent group. It's bad news for Labour, but I also think it's bad news for the existing two-party structure. I think people want something new and something different. Now, I've said already that I thought the launch was a bit like amateur hour. Well, I've got to tell you, folks, it got worse and worse and worse, because just two hours after resigning from the Labour Party, saying that it was riddled with anti-Semitism and racism, Angela Smith, who is a Labour MP um, from the city of Sheffield, appeared on Politics Live, and this is what she said. This is a really incredibly important debate, and we need to work through it rather than running away from it. I understand that. And I I would add to to the argument made to say that uh, a white working class woman finds hard, life hard enough. A BME working class woman, and this is the gender aspect, mm-hmm. will find it even harder. But it's not just about colour. I mean, you know, the recent history of the party I've just left suggests that it's not just about being black or a funny, t- you know, oh different, B- from the BME community, but oh the, the Jewish community equally, the Jewish community equally suffers the same kind of cultural alienation. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Let's listen to that again, shall we? This is Angela Smith talking on the BBC. The recent history of the party I've just left suggests that it's not just about being black or a funny, you know, different... Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. The the Jewish community. This is not good. A funny what? A funny tinge. A funny tin. And then she stopped. But she's talking about people who are, are a funny tinge. Not good when you've just launched a group that's against racism. Um, So, what did Angela Smith, who before today wasn't very well known at all, let me promise you something, she's about to get very well known indeed. Um, So she decided that what she'd do is she'd do a face-to-camera apology. I've got to tell you, folks, it looks like a hostage video. It is just appalling. Here she is apologising. I've seen the clip on uh, from Politics Live. I'm very sorry about any offence calls, oh and I'm very upset that I misspoke so badly. It's not what I am. 
why I'm committed to fighting racism wherever I find it in our society. When in the hole, stop digging. I promise you this, and I called it the hostage video, that's what it looks like. It is so low grade and low quality. Uh, you don't know whether to laugh or to cry. Certainly you want to cringe. Go to lbc.co.uk to see the Angela Smith apology, or as I'm calling it, hostage video. lbc.co.uk. It is truly cringe making. So not a great start, but... As I say, Angela Smith now will be a lot better known than she ever was before, just not necessarily for the right reasons. So, Labour is in trouble. Is British politics about to fragment, or is the first-past-the-post system, if it's unreformed, going to hold it together? I think big change could be very, very close. I think Brexit is the main reason for that. And you add, but, but on top of that, Labour has this problem that the unelectable hard left are now in control of the party. That is what I think. If you disagree with me strongly, call 03456060973. I'm going to Harwich to speak to Simon. Good evening, Simon. Hello, sir. Um, nice to speak to you again. Yes, now you're the Labour man from up there, aren't you? Yes, yeah, I'm one of them. Um, I'm a Labour councillor. Yes. Um, I am worried about this split because of the fact... Um, how many more people will split? And it's not just MPs. We have Welsh AMs. We have Scottish ministers of parliament. We have Labour councillors up and down the breadth of this country. That's uh, what worries me. How many more people Simon, are going to... Simon, how, yes, long, how long have you been in the Labour Party? Ooh, uh, ten years or so more. Ten years or so. I'm a trade unionist. I'm a trade unionist as well, sir. Do you remember, Simon, are you old enough to remember... You know, the real hard left disrupting Neil Kennett's conferences back in the 1980s. Oh, I'm 38 this year, but right. my, dad, my, my dad was with the um, National Union of Railmen, but he wasn't hard left, and I'm certainly not hard, not hard left. In fact, I campaigned to leave the EU. But there you go, I'm not a pariah or anything like that. I suppose I'd be called a moderate in the Labour A moderate? Well, well very good. The, the point, Simon, I'm making is that Labour was completely unelectable in the late 80s into the 90s because the hard left had taken it over. And, and, and Neil Kennock, who I'm not a big fan of, but he did actually stand up and fight the militant tendency, and, and he won a great victory, and he paved the way, you know, for uh, first Smith and then Blair to make the Labour Party electable. The point I'm yes, making, yeah, I'm Simon, is... I'm fully aware of the uh, militant tendency and then it became yeah. the Socialist Party and everything else. But so here's I the point, the Simon. Of that. Here's the point, Simon. That you know, you're a moderate. You know, these people that have left, okay, unlike you, they're all pro EU, but they would identify themselves as being social democrats. If that wing leaves the Labour Party, it's got no chance, has it, at the next election? No, uh, no um, it all depends. I mean, if you look at the change in demographics as well and things like that for the future. Yeah, you I mean, there seems to be more students than that back in the Labour Party. And historically, you have people like uh, older people, 60 plus, you know, not all the time, but voting, conservative, things like that. And then you've got your new Brexit party. Where's that going to play out as well? Is that going to split the vote with the um, Eurosceptics with UKIP and things like that? You know, this is, seems to be very uncharted well, waters well, we're in. Well, that's my thesis tonight, Simon. My thesis tonight is what you saw today is a symptom of perhaps a big change in British politics. Simon, thanks for your call. And Simon, their Labour councillor, worried it's not just MPs, he thinks other ele elected Labour officials from around the country may well give up the ghost. David says, these Labour renegades will take the focus off Brexit, which Theresa May will be happy about. Yeah, for 24 hours, David, don't worry. Brexit is coming back. It certainly hasn't gone away. If Corbyn resigns the Labour leadership, could you see the Indy 7 flocking back to the Labour Party? Tom from Southend-on-Sea asks me. I think the problem is deeper, Tom, than just Corbyn and McDonnell. I think what's happened is, you know, a very large number of new members have joined the Labour Party and they're very, very far to the left of what Labour has been for the last 30 years. Gary is calling from Weybridge. Good evening, Gary. Good evening, Nigel. So, is Labour? How much trouble is Labour in, Gary? Um, not enough, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> not enough. Uh, up and down the country, the the, the, the demographics of Labour has changed. Um, what used to be uh, working class areas and you know of, of heavy industry mm. are something rather different today, and that that rather feeds an anti-Semitic uh, dynamic within the party. The bigger problem for Labour 
is the change of rules for leadership that, that uh, Miliband brought through. So the PLP, the Parliamentary Party, and the trade unions have been neutered, and the power now sits purely with the membership, uh, and the consequence of that is the membership has always been the more radical um, element of, of the of the Labour organ of the Labour. I think all parties, Gary, are, all parties are a bit like that. I think. No, absolutely. But if you put all the power there, you know, Labour used to yeah. be an interesting balance between the the, the trade unions, the PLP, and mm. the Tory parties. Mm. That that it's always like the Titanic with all the. Uh, the well, the the the, the well has removed. The water is just flushing all the way through the all the way through the boat right now. And Gary, have so, you been a Labour supporter yourself? I've been a member. I've been a, yeah, I've been. A, I was a member, an officer of the party for, but that was a, a, some time ago. And as a Jewish member, uh-huh. um, the, the anti-Semitism is not a new thing. Hmm. It's just an, it's just out of control right now. And how long ago, Gary, did you leave the Labour Party? I left pro- uh, straight after. Uh, shortly after Blair became Prime Minister, but I've been a member since I was 18, so it's about, you know, a fair bit of time. And why, why, okay, you say that problem's always been there, and and some people would argue that it's been there in British society in some form forever, and and, and just a question of degree. Why is it so much worse now? You think demographic change is the key, yeah? Demographic change, there's two things, and you have to go back to the the Durban uh, conference uh, post-apartheid, when they decided that the hating Israel and America was the next big thing for the left. Mm. Uh, and that's the coalition that now runs the Labour Party. Mm. That's why Jeremy Corbyn can sit down with Hamas and Hezbollah, but he can't sit down with uh, <laughs> Theresa May. He can't sit down with the, Labour, the Israeli Labour Party or any, Labour poli- or, or any politicians in Israel. Um, is the, get, Gary, of, let me ask you, is the, I mean, yeah. you know, you, you, you're a veteran political observer... Is the two-party system going to break, or is it going to hold? No, that's the problem. You know, you know from personal experience just how difficult it is. <laughs> I know better a, than anybody. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> even with a party that's gaining significant support in the country, mm. how difficult it is to gain to break through and gain one parliamentary seat. Yeah. Um, so the seven, for example, today, well, they'll get forced out by their, their constituency parties. They'll put in a Corbynista in their place. And the voters and the electors will vote, in, vote for Labour as they did before, more or less. Uh, Gary, it's, I, I agree with you. It's very difficult to see any of these seven getting re-elected. Very, very difficult indeed. Gary, thank you for your experience. Really interesting. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. It's now 6.46 and time for the news headlines with Philip Krisikos. I get an anonymous text and it says, Are you ready to apologise, Farage? Honda pulls out. Is this the glorious Brexit future you promised? Well, you're quite right. There is an announcement today that Honda will be pulling out of Swindon with the potential loss of 3,000 jobs but both the uh, MPs have both said pretty much the same thing, that this decision is based on global trends and not Brexit, as all European car market production is going to consolidate in Japan in 2021. I'd also point out to you that much of the problem in the car industry in this country, not so much Honda but many of the others, is because it was the British government who told us, you've got to have diesel cars because they're better for the environment. So we all started buying diesel cars. Firms started manufacturing cars with diesel engines. Oh, and now we're told, actually, it's worse for the environment. There you are. Never, ever trust government. But whoever you are, let me point this out to you, if you like. Citigroup today have announced they're in talks to buy its Canary Wharf headquarters for a reported 1.2 billion sterling in a major show of confidence in London's status as a global financial centre. And this, of course, backs up last year in 2018, both UBS and Goldman Sachs both paying more than a billion to buy their own buildings. Now, there is an argument that the pound being a bit weaker makes London property a bit cheaper for them if they're using foreign money, but these are massive confidence boosts in the long term of the financial services industry in this country. But I promise you something, folks. I promise you, if you watch the BBC News tonight, you will hear nothing about Citigroup's 1.2 billion. I promise you, because all you get from them is negativity. British politics could be about to fragment and fracture. I believe that process is now underway. These parties are no more really, than unhappy coalitions. Sean is a new caller from Eastbourne. Good evening, Sean. Good evening, Nigel. Welcome to the show. So, how significant are these seven leaving the Labour Party? Oh, I don't think it's as significant as it's being made out, really. Go on. 
Well, because uh, if you take, for example, Chaka Ramuna, uh-huh. uh, ever since uh, the, uh, Jeremy Corbyn won the leadership election against Owen Smith, uh, he's been trying to put pl- pl- his way to um, break away, really, since then, anyway. So I think uh, yeah. this is just... Uh, there is some truth in that, Sean. But, Sean, the argument I'm putting to you is that the Labour Party needs that social democratic wing to be actually electable in the country. And if, and if they start to lose it, they're in real trouble. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you've seen uh, Tom Watson's statement this evening. I did. But I think uh, he's got a really big part to play here, because if, if he can get this through to Jeremy, I think potentially, um, I know it's unlikely, but if these have by-elections, the, the seven today, mm-hmm. uh, that could leave Labour in a great position, because there is some talented uh, councillors in the Labour Party that could potentially bring the party closer together and provide a proper opposition to the failing government at the moment. Well, Sean, I'm prepared to have a wager with you there will not be by-elections in any of those seven seats. Yeah, yeah. well, they're, they are all quick to say a second referendum, aren't they? All well, they, well I mean, Chucker wants a people's vote. Let's have a people's vote in Streatham. Let's have, a, let's have a people's vote about Chucka, shall we? I agree with you, Sean, but it, Sean, I agree with you, and I, I well remember when, when, when Reckless and Carswell left the Conservatives and joined UKIP, they both held by-elections to justify what they'd done, but it isn't going to happen. Sean, you sound like a Labour Party member. Yes, I am, yes. And are you a new Corbyn Easter member, or have you been there for some time? Uh, no, I was there uh, sure, uh, just before Ed Miliband lost his election. OK, so, Sean... Do you see, as someone that's been in the party since before Corbyn, the, yeah. cri- the criticism that the hard left have hijacked it? Do you, do you recognise that problem? Yeah, I mean, me personally, um, I didn't vote Corbyn to be the leader anyway. Right. Uh, at the time, I voted for Andy Burnham, which I think they would be in a better position today if that was the case. So you're from the moderate wing of the Labour Party? Yes. And, 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 and do you look at some of the things that have been said by Labour activists with horror? Yes, yes, I do. So are you going to stick with the Labour Party, or, or, or are you off to join Chucker and the gang? Oh, no, definitely not, no. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll stick with the Labour Party. Okay. I think if the right people get around Corbyn, uh, potentially, uh, th- this could be the best news they've had in a while. OK, all right, Sean, thanks very much for your perspective. I'm up to Whitehaven to speak to Robin, who I've spoken to before. Good evening, Robin. Well, Nigel, um, I, I would like to hope that the seven MPs have left. If they believe true, in true democracy, they should um, call a by-election. Yeah, but they um, won't. Because it's, it's respecting the constituents, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and anything other than that, I think, is total disregard and disrespectful. I don't disagree, Robin, for one moment, but let's assume it won't happen and move on from there. How, right. how, so, how serious is this split for the Labour Party? I don't think it's serious at all. The Labour Party, um, I think the last time I heard, was 500,000 members. That's half a million members. Uh-huh. Um, so seven MPs leave, and I don't think the Parliamentary Party and the power within the Labour Party, the members are with a social democratic party run by the members, grassroots members. We're the ones who go out knocking on the doors. We're the ones who pick the parliamentary candidates. So the seven people who've went, you've got to ask themselves why they went, um, there's all kinds of different re- reported reasons why they went and whatever else. But you said about the uh, the need that social democratic wing. The Labour Party is a social democratic party. We're, five, we're half a million members strong. Now, there's a lot of criticism about Jeremy Corbyn as well. Now, Jeremy Corbyn is doing a fantastic job with the Labour Party. The Labour Party was born from the ordinary working man and woman to give social justice to us in this country. Now, at the last election, Jeremy increased the share of Labour's vote higher since 1945 than any other leader at election yeah, it was time. A, so it was a huge increase, and he had a very, very good few weeks, Robin, and I wouldn't take that away from him. I mean, he had great energy. But since then, it's all been downhill, hasn't it? No, it certainly has not been downhill. If you listen to certain parts of the media, you would believe it to be downhill. Well... But it's Jeremy Corbyn who's got the Tories on the run at the minute. Robin, if I look at if, if I look at Jeremy Corbyn's personal approval ratings across a variety of polling companies, he's seriously on the slide. But, hey, you've got the faith in Corbyn. Robin, is, is Jeremy going to win the next general election? Uh, Nigel, I'd like to say to you, Jeremy's going to win the next election. Cheese and May, bring it on. At the last election, Jeremy was miles behind in the polls. He was. Labour were going to be wiped out. Yep. And he took David Cameron's majority off trees. And, and you think well, lightning will strike twice, Robin, yeah? 
It, it isn't late. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. just teasing you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to finish tonight because it, you could have knocked me down with a feather. And that was the interview that Eddie Mayer did earlier with Vince Cable. Let's hear it again. British politics is changing. The, the, the two big parties we're used to are now beginning to fracture. I don't agree with what Nigel Farage said, Good actually, Lord. a few months ago. About I'll just that. say that again. Go on. Uh, I agree with <laughs> what Nigel Farage said a few well. months ago, that the, the political system is fracturing. I agree with Nigel. Well, you could knock me down with a feather. I'm going to have to go off and, and have a glass of something, I but think. But do you agree with Vince? Uh, um, rarely, but I like him. He's a very civilised human being. And, and I think, actually, uh, part of today's split uh, in the Labour Party was about the lack of civility in politics today. And I can disagree with Vince, but you know what? Sit down and chat with him, and I like him. I'm back to tomorrow evening. At 10 tonight, is Tom Swarbrick. But as you already know, up next is Ian Taylor. Nigel, thank you very much indeed. Well, coming up on the show, you won't be surprised to know that we are going to concentrate on today's uh, event.